So good evening and welcome. Uh, this is our financial aid night. And um, before we get started, I'd just like to introduce our staff that's here tonight with me. Um, both Mrs. Steinis and Mr. McManus joined us. So I really appreciate um, our staff, as I mentioned um, last week at our college admission seminar, that um, you know the team of people that work in the counseling office are really amazing. And I'm proud to be a part of that team. Um, proud for the work we've done, how we support kids and families, and I'm excited for our journey together the rest of this year too. So as I talked about the admission night, you know, our goal is to provide you with relevant information that will hopefully help you through this process. This night is aimed at rising juniors and seniors. Um, so it's really focused more on the upperclassmen as they get ready to the, the final stages. Um, I had a teacher stop me this morning and say, uh, Mr. Dyer, could you get the material for tonight? Cause I want to plan for my kindergartner. This night really isn't aimed at that. All right, so hopefully you did start planning in kindergarten, and if not, our presenter tonight will help you start figuring that out, how to uh, manage the next couple years. Um, and uh, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about Julie before I introduce her. Um, we've had Julie Savino for a number of years, and um, I'm always impressed with what she has to present, the information she shares, and her insights into the financial aid world, how to navigate it. Um, she comes with a wealth of experience with over, um, her, this is her 40th year at Sacred Heart, and that's a long time um, to be in the financial aid game. And, you know, knowing all the changes and the updates to the law, you know, it is great to have an expert that knows financial aid inside and out, because I often think that I know a little bit about it, but every year that I sit and listen to her speak, I learn something. Um, so it is um, with great um, admiration and recognition that I welcome Julie Savino for us tonight. You want me to use the mic? How are we good with the mic or without it? Am I good without it too? No, we really oh, you want, oh, you're, recording. you're recording. Oh, okay. Thanks. All right. So we're recording tonight. Okay. So, um, we'll go ahead with tonight's presentation. Um, Todd, it was a very nice introduction. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and to share my information that I have regarding the process with you. Um, as he said, I've been in this for a long time, but there's a lot of things that have changed over the years. You know, I was just mentioning to somebody today, um, as we were talking about it um, within our profession, it's a profession that changes every single year. So I've never been bored, actually. I've always been kind of, you know, kind of on the go and ready to respond to any of the changes that we have. So hopefully I can give you some insight into the process and try to relieve some of the anxiety that you might have. Um, so here, what we've got here um, tonight, and you know, some of the parents just walked in tonight, and you know, for the students, the scariest part is where am I going to get in? You know, that's really what they're focused on right now, rightly so. Okay, but for the parents, it's like the scary process is um, how am I going to pay for it? So tonight, while we might have maybe provided some other beverages to my kind of make the evening a little lighter, um, I will try to. Um, interject a little bit and try to make it a little bit more um, interesting and maybe fun and maybe take away some of the anxiety regarding um, behind this particular process. So um, let's talk a little bit about some myths and realities. People get scared by this particular process because they read a lot in the news and they hear a lot on television and you know there's all these thoughts about there and maybe you've had some experience or you've heard from some other family members or friends regarding this financial aid process and why they either did receive something or didn't receive it. Um, some people always think that the published cost is going to be, or your sticker price, is going to be the true cost. It's not necessarily the case. With the number of students that receive financial assistance in this country today, what everybody should be focused on pretty much is going to be your net price, okay? Because you're going to want to be looking at um, you know, the financial assistance or the outside scholarships or the, you know, the number of things that students would be paying. So it's going to be net price that we talk about. Um, the myth is that only low income families qualify for financial aid. 
Well, yes, absolutely they do. There's lots of need-based aid, but need-based aid is not just for low-income families. And there's other types of financial assistance. So when we're looking at need-based aid, we're looking at an estimated family contribution applied against a cost of education, which at some colleges and universities is really high. There's some institutions that have tuitions, I'm sure you know already, that have tuitions at least $60,000 or more. So you're looking at a family contribution um, weighed against the cost, and that's really um, why people will qualify for some need-based financial aid. It's not all just low-income students. The myth is that student debt is at crisis levels and that almost all students are borrowing over $100,000. Well, I'm not so sure it's at a crisis. Um, I think that people are more concerned about what they borrow for college today, more so than they were 10 years ago, all right? Maybe at that point we were heading for a crisis when the majority of how people were financing it was all through long-term debt, all right? Now, there are some students that are going to have $100,000 worth of debt. That's true. But it's not everybody. It's only really about 4% of our population or students in repayment have debt over 100000 And some of that's really deliberate on the part of the students or the parents at that point. So um, some of them are in advanced degrees. How many of you already know that it's not just four years? You're looking at five or more, more than four. Anybody? Anybody? Yep. Yeah. Um, most students today are going for pre-professional degrees. They're already looking at four, five, and six years, sometimes seven already from the get-go, depending on the programs that they're in. So those are a lot of the students that are leaving those programs are the ones that have the $100,000 worth of debt, okay? So it is important that we understand it. Um, borrowing is important, but make sure that we're going to be prudent about what we borrow. So tonight we're going to talk about the sources and types of aid that are available, what the application process is. Of course, that's the, the confusing part. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about eligibility, some of the things, the items that we use to determine financial need or other eligibility for um, grant or scholarships. And then I'm going to leave you with um, a whole part of the packet, which you already have in your presentation. And of course, the guidance, the guidance office is welcome to put up um, the program on their website or to, you know, to leave it with you, um, which have tools and tips and thoughts for the process that you can leave with. Today. How many of you have been through this before? Anybody? Okay. All right. So there's a few of you that have been through it before. You know, the people do survive. We will, we will survive. <laughs> You're looking like maybe not. <laughs> no, maybe we've got a few more going to college at the same time makes it a little bit more difficult. All right. So who qualifies for financial aid? I've said I've been in this business a long time. These principles have never changed. From the day that I walked into the financial aid office, I ended up getting a work study job at Sacred Heart University and never left. Okay, so I've been there a long time. And um, these have been the principles of which I've grown up with and in fact um, have never changed. Everybody still believes this to be the case. Students and parents are primarily responsible for financing education, basically up to their ability. It is assumed that college and, you know, and um, higher education comes with a sacrifice, all right? We are all going to make some kind of sacrifice towards being able to, to reach that ultimate goal. Financial aid assessment is an evaluation of economic strength. It's not looking at how much cash flow you have or it's not d directly pointed towards one thing, not necessarily just your income or your savings. It's looked at as kind of a group of items to assess um, your financial strength as a family. That family contribution is a standardized calculation, all right? It's standardized, whether it's the calculation used by the federal government or it's a calculation that's used at the college level itself by the institutions. It is just there as kind of um, to give us an indication of what the family's ability to pay. It certainly doesn't represent what you might be willing to pay as a family, okay? Or you feel you are able to pay based on some other extenuating circumstances. Financial aid is never, um, not supposed to be the end all to it all. Financial aid is really only considered a supplement. It's always to assure that students have an option somewhere, 
some place for higher education, whether it be at a community college, a public institution, a private institution, somebody, will, the each student will be able to get an education. The bigger part of the financial aid provides um, not only just access, but choice, okay? So that students can maybe go to the college of their first choice because some financial assistance or scholarships or grants have been made available to them so that they don't have to just go with what would be considered a financial safety school without any support. Okay. All right. So the sources and types of financial aid, these as now of you as um, students and as families, you need to be able to focus on the grants and the scholarships. Those are the things you want to start investigating first and foremost. All right. That's what's going to be the free money. Oftentimes it's going to come with some kind of criteria attached in some ways. Um, grants obviously might be based on financial needs. Scholarships might be based on talent, skill, participation, leadership, a number of other things. But you want to be able to focus your attention on those first. All right, then the work study programs. As I said, I wouldn't be in this job today if it wasn't for the work study program. Work study is not a lot of money when we talk about it, but the importance of work study is connecting the student to the campus. All right, and that's really what you want to do with work study. So most students, even freshmen, even if they're living away, it's kind of like a 24-7 proposition. They can always fit in a few hours a week, no matter where they are, or where, no matter what institution they have, um, you know, they're, they're going to be attending. So please make sure that if you have that offer, you take advantage of it, even though it does appear to be small, it can be pretty influential for the student. Okay. Federal Stafford loans. Again, we talked about loans being an important part of the process. The Federal Stafford loans come in two ways. They are subsidized, which means there's no interest while enrolled. And then there are the unsubsidized loans where interest accrues while the student is enrolled. All right. Either way, neither one has to be repaid while the student is in attendance on at least really basically a half-time status, all right? And that, um, you know, so those are important. Those are the main programs that you should be looking at. Always make sure when you get your award packages, because you're going to get lots of them, they're all going to describe various grants, scholarships, loans, and work programs. Please make sure you understand each part of that for each college and institution, understand the award letter and know which part is free, which part has to be earned, and which part you're going to have to repay, okay? Now this is all of our um, aid for, and, and I apologize, for whatever reason, I've got some funky stuff going on in the presentation where it doesn't always print, so this is a superimposed picture. Um, and I might even have to get up to that chart where I'm seeing it's not producing very well. I guess I have to take this with me. Okay. All right. Um, so when we talk about this chart, this is kind of what we've actually been um, we've been seeing. This is in 2016-2017, um, based on the information that was provided by the College Board last year. It's our last complete documented year. We're in the process right now of collecting the 17-18 information, and we'll be able to have that available to our students. But now we're actually looking at right here, those are our Pell Grants. If we start at the top at 12 o'clock, that's a federal grant program. That's for our most needy students or what we consider our economically disadvantaged in the country. There's 26.6 billion. We seem to be increasing about $10 billion, 10 billion plus each and every year these days. And it's not always necessarily in the form of loans, okay? So that's your Pell Grants. Then there's some other federal grants. Those are basically controlled on the campus level. And there are some things that students can apply for based on either the academic major that they're in or some of the functions or um, kind of attaching themselves to like a Pell Grant. Then we have our federal work study. While it's not a significant portion of the pie, it is good and the government is contributing more and more towards that, particularly in the form of those institutions who do lots of community service. So students actually can participate in those uh, work study programs and receive some little extra cash along the way. It's typically not more than that. It's not used, utilized to really pay for their college education. It's just kind of a support, a support system. Now, a couple of years ago, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have even seen veterans or military grants even appear on this 
part of the pie. But right now we not only have the veterans themselves receiving financial assistance, but their dependents, okay? So with chapter 33 and with yellow ribbon and a number of other things in, in all the armed forces, we're starting to see more and more of our families can getting um, assistance in that form. And that has been growing. Um, like I said, it, you know, 10 years ago it was non-existent. Now it's 5% of all of the funding. These are our federal loans. It's $94.9 billion or 38%. Again, if you had looked at this chart five years ago, um, maybe, you know, obviously 10 years ago, this would have been over, almost um, over 50%, okay, your federal loans. It was actually creeping up on the side of almost 60% of all the financial assistance that our students were receiving. So you can see that this is actually being squeezed. People are starting to think more cautiously about the kind of loans that they take both in the student loans and the parent loans and others. Here you have your education tax credits. They may not come to you directly as far as grant assistance to try to help you pay the bill. Where you're actually going to receive that, if you're eligible, is through your income tax. And those deductions are available. But that's been increasing for our families um, each and every year. So that's a growing portion. So you'll get the money back on your taxes and oftentimes you know that comes as a little bit of a bonus and does help if there's a tuition payment to be made at that time of the year so here we have our non-federal loans they're starting to track those more and more we have those non-federal loans which are some alternatives out there that we have there are primarily a lot of the state loans we have a state loan program here in the state of connecticut so that actually is starting to increase together and it's still only five percent but people are being cautious about how much they are actually borrowing and all of those programs and being as good consumers in the education loan business as you would be with a mortgage with your mortgages and any of the other large expenses in life and here we have state grants the unfortunate part of state grants is they've been They've been closing in. I mean, you know, the, at first, you know, maybe a decade ago it was 6%, then it was 5%, now it's 4%. Most of our states are actually reten ret retrenching a little bit. They're actually not providing as much support for their state residents unless it's in the form of like that, the, um, you know, like in Yukon, where as a resident you're going to be paying a reduced cost. Okay, so it's kind of like that non-funded financial aid that they have there. So the real funded financial aid in most of the state programs is actually um, much less. In Connecticut in particular, most of our um, grant programs for not only our community colleges, but for our state institutions as well as our private institutions has really dried up. We've actually lost millions of dollars over the last couple of years and our programs are starting to become rather small, but they are still available to our students so and I do have a slide regarding the state program so sh you should be investigating those options always for what exists in Connecticut here these are our institutional grants this is obviously the most powerful portions of the grants and I think that's 58.7 percent or what is that 24 percent of the the pie yeah and it's like 24 percent of the pie so that's really where the institutions control most of the dollars all right they're the ones that have that money available to you and that's really what you're going to want to focus on in all of your college searches to see what those colleges and universities are providing to our students and then years ago we might have thought our private and employer grants were going to dry up you know with the financial crisis in 2008 into 2009 and while everybody kind of repositioned themselves during that period of time we've actually seen an increase in the percentage and the amount of private foundation and grant giving because they really do want to continue to invest in our students so there's lots of opportunities your guidance community is already office has already given you some websites um, where you can do some searching and in our presentation later you're also going to see where you can um, do some searching on your own. So our students are finding that to be a really positive part of um, the financial aid process. So you want to be considered for financial aid. The most important thing we don't want you to do is we don't want you to make these, these fatal mistakes. These are the things that throw you off, all right? Everybody, you know, and people already, um, 
make the assumptions of their own. Well, I'm not going to get anything, so I don't want to bother to go through the process. I hope that anybody who ever hears any of my presentations never ignores the fact that they should at least try the process. Always submit the forms, okay, at least once, okay, in the freshman year. You can decide after that point whether you want to continue to go into the processes, but please don't miss it for the first time, okay, when you're going to college for the very first year. Don't miss any of the admission deadlines. Make sure you understand whether it's early decision, early action, or regular admissions, or on a rolling basis, you want to know what that admissions office is requiring at each one of the colleges and universities. As you have as many little pennants up on the walls, they have all their own rules and regulations and they have all of their own deadlines. The financial aid office also has its deadlines. Now, because the, the FAFSA comes out early in October, you're gonna find that most of your financial aid deadlines and your admissions deadlines actually align with each other, okay? So you can basically almost assume that those processes will flow together, okay, at most of the colleges and universities. Please don't make sure that you miss any portions of the applications. Always complete whatever they have. And you'll see that there's some unique applications. We'll talk about that. And when you're completing all your documents, please make sure that you don't leave anything missing, all right? Missing sometimes means that it goes into a black hole, particularly on the financial aid forms, okay? Unless it absolutely instructs you, instructs you to skip a particular section, okay? All right, so what we have for applications right now, um, and we've had for a very, very long time, is the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, all right? That's our federal government application. We've been using it for a very, very long time. Um, it's required for all federal and state financial assistance. Okay, um, that would be required. Now, when we talked about that larger portion of institutional grants and scholarships, we talked about um, you know being concerned about those dollars. We do have other colleges and universities primarily our private colleges and universities and also some scholarship organizations will use the CSS profile. That one's produced by the college board. It's not the only form out there, but it is one of the most popular ones that is done through the college board. The same place you're gonna take your SATs and you have other um, tools and resources through the college board sites. And then institutions may have their own applications because we all have very sophisticated technology systems and information. Oftentimes, your applications can be done just directly online at some colleges and universities. They may want you to fill out a series of forms or they may have some separate applications specifically for one type of aid or another or to apply for a specific program or academic program. So please make sure that you look for those institutional applications if they have them, okay? And then always be aware of the deadlines. Again, when you're looking at each one of the deadlines, you know that each college may have something different, but you are gonna find that most of them are going to be aligned pretty much with, again, the admissions decisions, and you're probably not gonna find anything much later than a February 15th deadline today. Maybe a few state schools might be a little later, but you're gonna probably make sure that that's gonna be probably the latest time that you're going to wanna to be prepared to do it. You can submit, you know, you wanna make sure if your deadline was February 15th, you wanna make sure that your information is in there at least two weeks prior to that. You don't wanna get caught with perhaps maybe not having an acknowledgement or understanding maybe that your information is incorrect. You'll have an opportunity to at least know it's going to the colleges and universities that you wanted to go to and that um, the information is accurate, all right? So please plan for that. So this is our studentaid.gov website. The federal government does a really, really, really good job of getting information to the students and to the parents today. Um, that wasn't always the case when I first started in the profession, um, but in fact, the federal government does an incredible job. If you went to this website, you would have every opportunity, and this is what it looks like, to apply for college. There will be tips in there. There will be helpful planning tools. There will be federal student aid programs that talks about what the federal formulas look like and how they determine eligibility. Brand new, and of course, this is great for students and for those of us who kind of live on these mobile applications, 
we've got our My Student Aid, um, My Student Aid mobile app right now. And you can actually go on your phone and you can just look up fafsa.ed.gov and you get a great little mobile app. Now, you don't have to do it all right now, but tonight if you go home, you can just kind of pick it up and you can see it's done there. It's actually very, very good. Um, they just came out with that this summer and um, we believe that it's going to be a place where students are going to be able to check a lot of their information. They're going to be able to check their loan information. They're going to be able to check their FAFSA information. They'll be able to make modifications, changes, and adjustments. And um, we think it's going to be a great part of uh, the process. So for some of you, any juniors coming here? Juniors? All right, so juniors. You're not going to actually want to fill out a FAFSA this year. But you could actually go to this FAFSA forecaster. And you can actually kind of get a taste of what it's like. You can put the information in. Um, you can get some of the results out. It's an early awareness tool, and it gives you a lot of other helpful pieces of information regarding all the application processes for financial assistance. So the FAFSA is there. If any of you who are even seniors want to go in there and just kind of play around with it, it's actually good as kind of a test site. But you do still, for those of you who are seniors going to start next fall, you do actually have to complete the actual FAFSA. This will not take its place. But it's a good place to go right now. Okay. For you. okay. Everybody needs to have a federal student aid ID. ID. Now, those of you who have been through the process before, you know your ID? You got IDs? FAFSA ID? You got your ID. Okay. Um, Everybody, this is going to be your access to the federal student aid online systems. Everybody is going to need it. It's, you, it's used to confirm your identity, obviously. We have passwords and we have usernames in so many systems today. Um, this is an important place for you to have it. Now you're going to be able to go on and you're going to get your, um, every student is going to get a FAFSA ID and every parent. You need at least one parent in the process to complete the FAFSA to have a student aid ID. We recommend, or at least I recommend, if you're a two-parent family, both parents should actually get the ID. One might complete the FAFSA, one might be the parent borrower on a student parent loan. So you want to make sure that each one, every parent has it. And while you're doing it for one, you might as well go online and do it for both of you when you're going online to do it. Okay. Um, okay, you're going to create the FAFSA ID on this particular website. You're going to go there. You could go there now, all right? Um, those websites are open and available all the time, okay? You're going to put in your basic information here. The one thing that we recommend for the students is if they're going to put in an email address, they do not use the high school email address because that's not going to last with them for very long. So. During this process, it should be a personal address that they're using, a personal, so if they don't already have their own personal email address outside of the high school, now would be a good time to get that, but most students do. Um, all the information has to match with the Social Security Administration, so you're not going to use nicknames or anything else. You're going to do what's exactly on file with the Social Security Administration in order for you to get um, your you know, easily without any snafus. Okay, so here we'll talk about at least about the form itself. The FAFSA.gov, make sure you don't go to anything that's called FAFSA.com. FAFSA.com are the places that will charge you actually to complete the FAFSA. And of course, they'd love to be able to make money on you, but the, the form is just so simple and easy. Please make sure that you don't fall prey to any one of those um, sites or those scams. They are now available as of October 1, 2018. So this is a good time to start planning. So I'm really happy that high schools are starting to plan early now, besides the fact that I could usually get somewhere before it's dark. And I can enjoy your beautiful location driving up here, your beautiful scenery as opposed to the dark part. Um, but anyway, October 1, remember that date. Now, you don't have to file it by October 1st unless there's an institution that has a very, very early deadline or that you're looking for some kind of early decision um, process where they would want it. But um, it is available. 
It's submitted each year the student is in school. We are going to use the federal methodology, as I talked about. It's basically what the government does to determine their formulas or eligibility for their aid. It's one FAFSA per student, not per family. So if you have more than one child going to school, each one of them has to have their own FAFSA. Your information will be the same, but the student's information will be different on each one of that form. There is no cost at all to this FAFSA application. What we've been fortunate to be able to move up the deadline to an October 1 from that old traditional January 1 is because we're using a prior prior year's income information. So right now we're going to be looking for the 2017 income tax information, what we've already done. And because we that information is already filed for the majority of our families, we'd suggest the use of what's called the data retrieval tool. Excellent part if you choose not to or if you're not eligible to use the data retrieval tool, you will have to enter it manually. And if we're talking about divorced or separated case, um, you're only going to use the custodial parent on the FAFSA form, okay? And if that parent is remarried, like with a step parent, it has to be that parent as well. Okay, so that's who you're going to be using for, for the information. It's also going to include some other things, and we're going to talk about it a little bit later, but like savings, assets, family size, number in college, um, et cetera. Okay. So here's a little bit about the federal data retrieval tool. Um, people were concerned about it in the past. As administrators, we were concerned about it too. But the government in particular um, was concerned when they had a small breach. Well, actually, I guess it was a pretty large breach. But now the ink, it is so tight, so tight in the process. It's actually, it, it's very, very good and it's very secure. So for your ease in processing, we make the suggestion that everybody use this, this, um, this data retrieval tool. You're going to basically, when you use the information, you're going to ask, it, you're going to be looking at on the parent financial information page, you're going to be looking to determine what your eligibility questions are, if you actually qualify for it. So you can go and you can go to that website and look there. You can enter your FAFSA ID. And then you're going to click on the link that says click to the IRS. So you're going to actually leave the federal student aid website for the FAFSA and you're actually going to be brought to the IRS. At the IRS site, you're going to authenticate yourself again with information that you have there. They will tell you, because they know you're in the FAFSA, they will tell you the fields that they believe you will need to be able to import into your FAFSA. All right. But nobody's going to see that information. It's just going to list the fields for you. I mean, if you felt more comfortable, you could at least have your income tax, you know, a copy of it on the side, but it's not necessarily something that you're going to do. You're going to say, yes, this is good. Transfer my information to the FAFSA. At that point, nobody sees any information, all right? You will not see the information. It will not pop up on the screen and say, this is what's that. It's going, and it's, once you go back into the FAFSA site, it's not going to show the information there either. It's not going to show the dollar amount. What it is going to show is it's going to say, this applicant transferred their information from the IRS site, all right? So that you know that that's secure, okay? And it's the right piece of information. You're going to repeat the same thing for the student as well, okay? There are a few cases in which you cannot use the DRT site, but for the most part, we find most of the families are able to use it. Okay. So once you've submitted your information, now back at the college, okay, we are all getting the information that you've submitted on that form. And if you submitted four or five or six different institutions, we're all getting it. Okay. So we're bringing in our information every single day. And as we bring in our information, we're getting it. Now, we do see the income information, all right? So we do actually see it, all right? So the colleges can actually confirm the information, but nobody else can. So we bring that information in. But you also, as soon as you've completed your FAFSA, you will get a response back, and it's called the Student Aid Report. And in that Student Aid Report, it is important for you to review that information. 
even though you might have had information to transferred from the IRS, and you can't change that once you've actually imported it. You cannot change those fields. Um, but there may be other things that you feel you want to make a correction to, like cash or savings or something else or some other information that you have. So you want to look at that. Oftentimes, some files will be selected for verification. The government makes that determination for a whole host of reasons. It could be that there's an inconsistency somewhere in the form, particularly if you did something manually and they have something else left back into the, in their shop because all your information is basically plugged into about six or seven different federal sites all right, with, with um, the FAFSA. So they could require you for verification or it could just be a random sample has nothing at all to do with what you submitted. It could just be that you were randomly picked. So if a college and university knows that you've been selected for a review, they might say, okay, well, we'll let you update your information, and in the meantime, we'll send you a tentative award. And then there are some colleges and universities that will say, uh-uh, uh-uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to update everything first, and then we're going to send you out an award. So either way is right. Okay, I'm not sure one is better than the other, um, but just so that you know, that's, that's the reaction you could get. And if you're applying to four or five or six different institutions, you could get varying degrees of what those policies are at that particular institution. Now, we do know because we are looking at two years worth of data, okay, information, finances, may not always reflect the current financial situation. I've yet to see since we went to prior, prior year, people that have had a boost in their pay or their income coming forward and saying, oh, please change my information and let's update it. But we have a whole lot of folks that have had uh, changes in, the, in their income situation or their family size or a number of things that would suggest that we maybe have to make some adjustments or change for that. It's not done. You would not be doing that yourself. You would be bringing it to the financial aid office You'll be presenting the information that would be updated. Um, the college or university will recommend what they want to look at, and they will make the changes for you. Okay, so you're not going to make the FAFSA changes, but the college or university will. Okay. All right. So for those of you who have already thought about your colleges and universities, anybody know that you already have to do a CSS profile application? Anybody? No. You're not sure of that yet? Okay. All right. Um, you know, oftentimes the private colleges and universities are going to want to look at this. So that's the location. Again, it's a 10-1. It supports, similar to the federal government, a methodology to determine funding. And the colleges and universities, what, Todd? You should. You should. Everybody should. Yeah. Double check. Some colleges, private colleges will want it. A lot of them, there's over 400 colleges and universities that want it. And it's pretty much, it, it's very common on the um, East Coast and then again on the West Coast. All right. So chances are you might see that you need it. Um, it may only be required one year. Oftentimes, we only require it for our first year students. Now, we're a user of it at Sacred Heart University. We only require it one time as a freshman. Or if families have had changes in their family circumstances and they want to appeal, we'll recommend that they utilize that form for us in subsequent years where they're asking us to make a specific change. But a lot of the institutions will only want it one time. It's a little bit more comprehensive information, a little bit more thorough, and it's the basis by which we're going to want to to distribute our own institutional aid. Again, just like the um, FAFSA, it's one per student, not per family. There is a charge to this one, and that's what you have there. It, too, is going to also use the 2017 income tax information. There is no um, IRS data retrieval here. Everything has to be manually entered, OK? In divorced and separated parents, on the primary application, you will use the custodial parent information. But many colleges and universities, because this does give us an opportunity, we say there are some institutions that want a non-custodial parent application. So what will happen is the other parent will not see any of the information. The student instructs the other parent. 
here's my school coat, here's my, my ID, here's my information, please log in and just complete that portion of the application for me, please, okay? So it's really separate and then you never see it, um, their information, they don't see your information, it all just goes separately to the colleges and universities. Again, just like the FAFSA, it's going to ask a whole host of other pieces of information that result in our determining um, the student's eligibility for aid. So when we're determining eligibility for aid, um, we're going to look at a couple of things. It's a pretty basic formula. You're basically taking cost of attendance minus the federal EFC. And for tonight's presentation, we're going to talk more so about the federal EFC because that's standard everywhere you go. All right. Institutional EFCs, even though they might be calculated for institutional aid, will fluctuate based on how the college actually evaluates it. But nationally, a federal EFC remains the same for you no matter what college or university you go to. So if you're looking at the cost of education, and that's going to be our va variable, your federal EFC is going to stay the same. Your financial need is going to be the result of that. So if you're looking at four or five, six different colleges and universities, they each have a different cost of attendance, your EFC is the same, um, and that your financial need, again, will vary according to the cost of education of each one of those institutions. So at one institution, you may have no financial need, but at another, you may have some significant financial need. Okay, so here's your cost of attendance. It's basically um, representative of we, what we consider direct costs, all right? So we've got our direct costs first, which are tuition and our required fees. That's gonna be billed to you by a um, college and university. So any commuters here? Anybody who wanna commute? No? Oh, you want to commute? Oh, good. Okay, sort of, kind of. Okay, maybe. All right, that'd be good. That'd be good. Um, of course, that'll spare your folks the room and board, okay, um, which is pretty pricey these days, although it's some places are so luxurious. You come to our campus, and you basically say, I want to live here. So, hey, I'm going to send them home. I want to live on campus. It's so nice. Um, but anyway, those are going to be the things that you're going to be directly charged by the institution. But we know that's not all it takes to go to college, obviously. Um, there are indirect costs, and of course it's going to be the books and supplies. Colleges and universities will give you their basic estimates, their real average costs. But you know that average costs are made up of the highs and the lows. So if you've got somebody who's in pre-med or is in some of your, you know, your PA programs or in your pre-law and others, you may have nursing. The books and supplies may be off at the top of the charts, all right? They may be, you know, at our institution, our average is 1,200, but we have some students in nursing that have $1,000 a semester, okay? So it's more like 2,000 for them. So you know what your major is going to be. You can always ask that college or university, what do you think my cost of books will be if I'm going to be majoring in, in either the art, in art, in science, or in business, or um, in healthcare. Okay. Transportation to and from campus. Obviously, if you're going to be um, commuting, the transportation expense is going to be a little bit more. If you're going to be living on campus, it may be fine. If you're going far away. You have to plan on how many trips do you want to go. And I like to, to say the little story, you know, sometimes, you know, my girlfriend had her son wanted to go to Florida. And, you know, they always love to travel back and forth. And, of course, the first trip everybody wants to come home is what, the students? No, it's not even Thanksgiving. There's one before that. There's a holiday before that coming up soon, Columbus Day. You know, ca campuses kind of like close up, you know. A lot of students want to come, and hopefully they don't want to fly back if you're flying them away, but they do. But then they've got Thanksgiving, and then you've got Christmas. So when he was going down there, she said, he said, well, gee, I want to come home for Thanksgiving. And she said, oh, no, we're not spending the money to transport you. We're coming down to you for Thanksgiving. She, we'd rather come down there and spend time with you. So, um, because then before you know it, you've got Columbus Day, you've got Thanksgiving, and then a couple weeks later, you've got Christmas coming up, you know, and then the end of the semester. 
So the fall semester can, for some families, particularly the first year, can be a little bit um, costly as far as transportation is concerned. And I don't know how many of you would say, no, I don't think, no, you're not coming home. I think you need to stay. We need to save money. How many of you would say, okay, stay? You know, we're going to bring you home. Yeah, not many. Sometimes I usually have a father come up and say, no way, they can stay down there. But they can stay down there. That's okay. All right, miscellaneous, personal. It all depends on the student, how they live, how frugal they might be, or, you know, you just, they're just totally out of control while they're home here, and you know that's not going to be any different when they're away at school either. You've got, just got to cut off those miscellaneous expenses. I will say, though, once they've kind of run out their money on the ATM machine, maybe keep them with a, with a pretty small, a, a smaller amount if you got to worry about that. But then all of a sudden they call you and say, geez, I'm out of money. And you say to them, did you get that work study job that they offered you? Yeah, no, you know, I don't think I can fit it in. I'm not sure. Well, you know what? You're not getting any more money from me. You can just wander up there and claim your job and then you can use that for your own miscellaneous expenses. It's always just enough um, to keep them going. Okay, so here's the, now, so that's the one portion, that's our variable, cost of education, and here's now what an EFC looks like. Our expected family contribution looks like this. Um, an EFC is a measure of capacity over time to absorb educational costs. So many people feel that it's going to be what we think it's uh, extra money out of your current income and assets. Uh-uh, it doesn't reflect that at all. It's not an estimate of any extra cash you have available or that you might have. And it certainly isn't the same as what the student's bill might be, okay? It could be more or it could be less, okay? Um, so when I look at the EFC and I say a capacity over time, and when you look at the major components of the estimated family contribution or how we're looking to pay for college. It's a little bit of the past, which is our savings, our present, which is the majority of the contribution, okay? It's almost about 70%. And then it's, it's the pay as you go and your current income and then the future, how much you might be able to take on into the future. The younger the parent, the greater the expectation that they can continue to work for a number of years and help save towards those expenses. So it's a capacity over time. The federal EFC, which I said was going to be the focus of some of this, is calculated according to a formula established by law. We're not going to change it. That's why it's going to remain the same for everybody. Um, it's the information from the FAFSA and it's always used, the government determines the eligibility based on the index or the expected family contribution for the Pell Grant. Colleges and universities do not make that determination. It's kind of like an entitlement program and the Pell Grant, but other forms of aid on the college campus level, whether it be the work study program, supplemental grants, teach grants, or other aid, and then including the state aid, will be determined based on what that eligibility um, indicates based on the expected family contribution. As I said before, because we want that CSS profile and a number of private colleges and universities will want to do their own calculations, a little bit deeper dive than what the federal government does. And that is to award institutional and private sources of financial assistance. So oftentimes colleges and universities will use that and we will tweak it too. Oftentimes we will ask different questions than on the generic form because we have some things within our own methodologies at our college campuses that we value differently on a family's ability to pay. All EFCs are either they're federal or institutional subject to a school verification. One, if you were picked by the, the, the um, federal government or if the institution feels that there's some inconsistencies in the data and they again want to do a double check. All right, so they could do it. And then again, adjustments. Adjustments for your sake, okay? If your family size changes, if your income changes, if your asset situation changes, for any host of reasons that you feel are affecting, you're helping support an elderly parent, you've already had plus loans out that you're paying, they're not being taken into consideration for another child or something, you're going to want to bring those things forward. And oftentimes colleges and universities will make adjustments for those things outside of the traditional um, calculations that we have. 
elements of the federal need analysis system. So these are some of the key pieces. So when we're asking you those questions, you might wonder, well, how are we actually going to treat those pieces? So these are the ones that are the most dominant within the system and have the most impact on that um, federal um, expected family contribution. We're obviously going to use information for both the parent and the student. The parent's income, that is the major determinant. That is the biggest part of the calculation is what the parent's um, income is. We use standard income and asset protection allowances, particularly in the federal methodology. That federal methodology does not take into consideration regional cost of living, okay? Whether you're up in this part of, you know, in, in, you're in Connecticut or whether you're in Kentucky, whether you're in Kansas, whether you're in Michigan, whether you're in California, whether you're Hawaii or Alaska, it doesn't matter, okay? They're always going to use it, and it's basically based on the family size, a family size of four versus a family size of six. Family size of six obviously will get a bigger standard allowance against their income than a family size of four. We're always going to use some parent assets, okay? But parents' assets are pretty small. So people who have always said, you know, oh my gosh, you know, we have some money in the bank or we own our home or we have some other real estate or investments, you know, having it on the parent side isn't the worst place to have it because you're really only looking in between two and six percent of the total. So it's smaller. What, what is your income? The definition of income up here is going to be earnings, adjusted gross income, could be taxable and non-taxable income, could be income from a business, whatever's on your tax return, okay? Yes, that would be. That's a portion of income too. Pensions, yep, all those, the, whether they're taxable or non-taxable, depends on how you file your tax returns, what goes on there. So they will ask all those various income questions, okay? Non-taxable income is always treated a little bit heavier than the taxable because it doesn't make mo take money to make that money because it's kind of a fixed you know, so there's not as many allowances taken off of that, um, where it's earnings. You know, for us to earn our money, it costs us money, you know, whether it's in transportation or whether it's in, you know, clothing allowances, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's always um, a little bit more money taken off of that to protect your ability to earn, okay? Um, but if you're looking at students' assets, Students' assets obviously are going to be um, calculated at a much higher rate. We're going to take 25 to 35 percent of a student's asset. The reason being, they're saying, how unfair is that? But it's the student, you know, this is, this is the main thing for the student. They're bettering themselves, okay? Um, they're going to have plenty of years to earn their money, so let's take a larger portion of them as their commitment. It's their skin in the game in order for them to do well and for them to better themselves. So it's a long-standing philosophy. I don't think it'll ever change. Um, it's not the place where families would have wanted to put their elderly parents' income, you know, savings and stuff in there to, to save it. You can't really even move it over the years because everything is tracked through the IRS. And if there's inconsistencies like big dips over time, it's going to bring it up as a red flag. Okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Yep. You would. You would. Or the grandparent. Or the grandparent. Because then it doesn't appear at all. Okay. But it all depends on how the, the 529s are set up. Everybody can choose their own thing. The important part is a 529 plan provides you with security. You know, gives you options for choice and stuff that you can't depend on this financial aid system to make up for you. So, you know, I would rather say, you know, if you'd have thought and planned it in the student's name, oh, well, that's fine. You know, if they could get great scholarships and stuff you may not have to use at all anyway. An asset. Yes, they are. They, they are not. Qualified retirement assets are not in the federal methodology. We don't consider home equity and we do not, of the primary home, just the primary home, on the federal side, they don't look at your first home. 
they will look at if you have a second home or if you have other investments and stuff they will look at that but your primary home is not considered in the federal calculation or the retirement assets what you've already set aside however in the untaxed income section what you contributed for the 401k or your IRA account is added back as untaxed income in that one tax year in that tax year because that's considered to be discretionary even if your employer requires it okay okay so in box one of your w-2 that's your income right retirement 401k is not included you're saying they add that back in you do that's correct so if you had a contribution if you made six thousand dollar contribution in one year towards your retirement plan okay that will then because it's non-taxed all right it's non-taxed um, it will actually be taken back they ask you for that question back and then it's that contribution in that one year is added back as untaxed income okay in the calculation okay. all right now if you were talking about the um, CSS profile for the private schools and, and if anybody's going to be going to private schools that have this this is relatively important People believe oftentimes if we're using a CSS profile, it's because we want to squeeze more, you know, more juice out of, out of the lemon. You know, we want to take more out than we probably should. And that's not always the case. Because the institutional methodology technically gives a lot of benefits back. We still have, at least on our campus, you know, upwards of 35% of our families actually have a lower family contribution when we calculate it with the institutional methodology from the CSS profile than the federal government actually provides. So we can oftentimes, because we treat things a little differently, we may drop in home equity, okay, but we're going to protect against emergencies. We're going to secure a bigger portion of your income than the federal government does because we know that things happen, okay? Things happen. We also protect for college savings because you know, the firstborn isn't entitled to everything, although they think they are. Um, but we want to make sure that the other children, oftentimes, we're, we're still saving for them too, okay? We still want to put something aside. So if there's multiple children in a family, we're going to take off, based on their age, a protection for savings or encouragement for savings. Whether you do or you don't makes no difference to us, but we are at least going to recognize that. It's probably going to allow for medical expenses. Federal government could care less what you pay for medical expenses, medical insurance, or others. But we know that that's a pretty hefty expense for most families, which is unavoidable. All right. So in the CSS profile, we will take an allowance off for that. All right. And so it'll again, it might reduce it a little bit more. And then the biggest thing in here is that we adjust for regional costs of living. We will give a family of four much more in living in Fairfield County within this area, we will give them much more of an allowance against their um, standard allowance for living because you live in a more expensive part of the country than the federal government does, okay? So hence, because so many of our families are coming from the Northeast, our primary states being New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, and you can see why a lot of our freshmen actually have lower EFCs than what the federal government calculates out. Okay, it's to the students and families' benefit. Right? There's lots of options. And in a form like this on the CSS profile, they ask you lots of other questions. Don't try to second guess them and figure that you've got to have something that's actually, you know, carved in stone. You can't estimate on this estimate information um, better on this particular form than you would on the federal form. Okay. So this is a little bit about eligibility for financial assistance. And these are just examples of kind of how we look at um, this. And if you remember back to one of those first charts, I talked about the total cost minus the federal EFC equals the financial need. So if we've got two institutions here, we've got a, a private institution that is um, at 45,000. Your EFC is going to be the same. You're going to have need for 35,000. If you're at a four-year public, it's 27,000. You've got $10,000 worth of an uh, expected family contribution. 
you're going to have a much lesser financial need. It's only going to be 17. And of course, you could use this evaluation with a multiple number of institutions with varying costs of education up there and see where you might demonstrate more need at one institution than at another. Okay. But, um, you know, need-based aid, while we talked a lot about need and developing eligibility for need-based aid based on expected family contribution, that's not the only aid out there, okay? With all the colleges and universities across the country, many, many more are using merit-based aid, okay? So while we have our need-based aid, again, it's our Pell Grant, our work-study programs, it could be our state aid, institutions will offer need-based aid as well. But on the institutional side, you're going to have things like academic achievement, athletic achievement, leadership, um, participation, um, music, um, art, academics. Um, it could be for a different, um, if you're going into nursing, there could be nursing scholarships, donor-related scholarships at college campuses that are looking specifically for a type of student. So lots and lots of merit-based aid. Okay, lots of it, where students actually receive more because an institution values a certain characteristic of student. So while it may not be your first choice, sometimes what you might be receiving at your second choice institution may be more significant because they value something a little bit more than another institution does in the form of student life programming or academic programming or others. So this again is, is really kind of you know, this is your investigation of the colleges and universities you're looking at, understanding the students' characteristics, doing some of those great searches from all of those different sites that you have available, and from your tours and searches. How many of you did like the summer, you know, like, like the summer tours? You like all over? All over, huh? I mean, and that's where you're kind of investigating or looking at those colleges and universities. What do they offer, right? How different are they? and what do they recognize in the form of some kind of financial stipends for the students that some other institutions have no clue. They're, they're not even looking at it at all. So this is, this is big and this is a lot of your searching um, and, and the student and the family doing some special reconnaissance regarding that. So if we're looking at our financial aid packages and this is some examples of how we do our business. Again, Primarily, parents and students are primarily responsible for financing education up to their ability. So if their ability turned out to be $10,000, we're going to say, okay, the first $10,000 of that cost is going to be borne by the family. And then we're going to say, okay, from there, we want the students to be self-sufficient in some way. So we believe that we would like to see a student get a $5,500 loan. So now if you went back to your studentaid.ed.gov website and figured out those student loan programs, you're going to find that the federal student loans for a first year student come in two ways. You get a subsidized, if you demonstrate financial need, for $3,500 and then you, every student can subsidize it with an additional $2,000 but it will be unsubsidized. You will be responsible for the interest on that money. So all freshmen can get $5,500. A lot of colleges and universities will use that as the base package for students helping themselves. And then the other part that students will help themselves with is some work study. But work study is going to help them to do the other things, the books, the supplies, the transportation, the miscellaneous. It's not going to go towards your direct costs, but it is going to help to fund your indirect costs, which are a real part of the overall total cost of education. Okay? So then here, what we would say is you're going to get some kind of grants from the college, whether they be a combination of federal, state, and institution, up to $28,000. And this would be a great package where we're basically saying we're meeting need 100% for our family. Now, not all colleges meet need 100%. The very few that probably do are probably your Ivy Leagues and some of the others that are extremely well endowed. But there's, a, there's quite a few of them that will be doing 100%. And that's not that all students don't get some kind of 100% need met in some way. Um, you know, on our college campuses, you'll find even in all the guidebooks, they'll say 72% of all of the students receive some kind of financial assistance, okay? Um, and, or have need met at 72%. 
that would mean we've got some at 100 and we've got some at 30. Okay, so somewhere around the middle, you know, when you take the aggregate of all the students and the average, you're going to find that, um, you know, need is met at all different levels. So what that means is that, again, most institutions will say, okay, we can do the, here's your 10, here's your loan, here's your work, but you know what, we don't have enough money to go around for everybody. Financial need is so high by most students, and we've got, you know, we're funding 98% of our freshmen in some way with a combination of need and merit-based aid. We cannot even come close to meeting our students' needs 100%, okay? So we're doing what we call gapping, or we're finding that families are going to have some unmet need here because you can't meet it for everybody, you know? And that's probably about 80% of the colleges and universities in the country cannot meet need 100%. You know, very rare the cases are. So really, in this case, if that institute student wanted to go to that school, what do they have to come up with? And not just 10, they've got to come up with 25. You know, it's 25. So if that's the choice, that's where you want to go, they want to go to 25. Then, but I said, okay, here's your 100% need met, combination of federal, state, institutional, and whatnot your grants, your loans, your work, and your family contribution. But you know, that merit-based aid, it's coming up again, it's coming up. And then we're gonna say, you know what? Athletics is big, you know? It's a, it's a big chunk, it's not for everybody, not for everybody, but good for some. And you know, they don't even care what you can contribute. All they care about is the student, you know? whether it's the soccer, whether it's the softball, whether it's the baseball, whether it's the football, whether it's the basketball, whether it's golf, tennis, you name it. And they're awarding for it in a lot of places. But then the important part is they really want the academic scholar. They really want, you know, the student athlete. And they're gonna get, offer them another 18. And you're saying, wow, that's great. Didn't you love that visit? Oh, the ambassadors were great. And they, you know, they're saying, but you know what? My overnight was terrible. I didn't like the other athletes. I just don't find it a good fit because you know, they might have calculated 10, but you only have to pay seven. So you're basically saying, let's give that place another try. Let's look at it again, you know? And they're saying, you know what, the cookies were terrible. The food was awful. I didn't like the room. There wasn't, an, the, the leaves just didn't rustle under my feet. I didn't get a feel that that was really the campus. All kinds of reasons why, you know. One, one mother, this is, this is a good one. We were, I'm in the, um, I'm in the big laboratory in, the, in our, um, our, our pit center, which is our athletic center. And this family was on tour and they were coming in and um, the mom, she, they were just, they had just been visiting all these colleges within a day. And then she was in there with her daughter and then they're all washing their hands and stuff were coming out. And she's like, oh, this place was just great. She says, it's so much better. You're, the toiletries here were so much better than Quinnipiacs. And I was like, yes. <laughs> All right, you know, keep it up, <laughs> campus up. You know, you've got somebody out there that that actually means something to, you know, who would think, you know? I was like, okay, great, you know? I mean, everything was like, everything was clicking on our campus, including that for the parents. And I was like, yes, you know? So um, that was pretty funny. So here, this is, this is where, you know, it's, it's like the heart over the head you know, where, where do you go and, and where's the pull, you know, for you? And this is where I sympathize with the parents. I really, really and truly do um, sympathize with um, what you have to struggle with and um, the different variations you may see at the different colleges and universities. Bottom line is, when you hit, you know, when you hit that wall, the reality sets in you're gonna pay your family share depending on the institution that you've gone to and you've weighed out whatever aid is there um, that's been awarded equals your family share. And here's how you find it. 
couple of things. Um, first, again, the major determinant was income. So that's going to be the first place you're going to want to look, okay, from income. Then families will say, okay, you know, a portion, you know, we don't want to deal with it all right now, you know, because they're going off to campus and, you know, you've got all these costs and everything and you're basically, you know, they're eating sushi and you're eating pasta now every night, you know, so you've got to start thinking, you know, okay, well, we'll borrow a little bit. And then we're only going to use a little bit of savings, okay? We might have more saved, but depending on what we've got, we're going to try this a little bit. We're going to try to mix it up and feel, you know, to what degree are we comfortable because we don't want to utilize all our savings now and it's, it is the first one going to college and we have others to consider too. So people will use this. Make no mistake though, these triangles are proportional to how families typically do it, okay? Um, it's always the smaller dependence on savings and kind of equal between income and loans and it is about a third, a third, and a third you know, kind of in, in that kind of range. So that's what you'd want to be looking at. So if you wanted to try to utilize all those different portions, the savings, the uh, loans, and the pay-as-you-go, first of all, you want to check your scholarship piece out first, okay? Because you can always supplement or you can reduce your family share first by the students doing outside scholarship searches, all right? Then, of course, save as much as you can even if it's small amounts, because you're going to at least be able to save for the books and supplies, maybe the deposits and a few of the other things. Uh, no amount is too small. You want to do some pay as you go. You want to stretch it a little bit. You don't have to do it all at once in one big chunk. You can actually do it over a payment plan. It's usually 10 months, not 12, but they'll give you those 10 months. And if you did find that the, it's too tough to do the 10 months, then you start looking at these options. And, you know, I order them in this way because this is how the government would like me to talk about it. We use the federal loan programs first. Always look at what's federally available to you first. And that's actually the federal parent loan program is a very, very good loan program. Then you have this Connecticut Family Education Loan Program. That's excellent. And as Connecticut residents, you should all look into that as an option. It's interest only while the student is in school and right now it's at a 4.95% fixed rate of interest. So that's what I would suggest you take a look at, too, and as Connecticut residents. Then there's the private alternative loans, as we saw. It's a growing portion of the pie on the beginning, and there are some good loan options there, but please be very, very good consumers. And then again, you want the personal family options, okay? Now, personal family options, we bring those forward because this is what families tell us. Of course, you want to look at home equity if you have it, okay? because again, still it's probably the cheapest that's out there right now. And if you've got to feel comfortable with doing that as well. Or say, for example, grandparents are part of the process now. Grandparents are part of the process. In reality, they come and visit our financial aid office and they get involved in helping make the decisions. Some people have the opportunity to have that available to them, that multi-intergenerational exchange, and some people don't. Um, like for me, when my daughter, my granddaughter, she's now eight, she just turned eight the other day, she's my first of my grandchildren, and I only had one son because that was a job hazard because I knew I could never educate more than one doing my job at Sacred Heart. I was never going to make enough money <laughs> to be able to educate more than that. So I had my one son, and I'm, I'm there the day that the baby's born, and what comes into my son, my son looks up at me and I, I'm thinking like I'm on cloud nine, my feet are halfway off the ground. And he says to me, hey mom, how long do you think you're gonna work? And I'm like, what the heck are you asking? He says, I'm gonna work a long while, Nick. You know, I love my job, you know that. And he says, oh, that's really good, mom. Cause I want you to be working when, when Alyssa's in college. He says, I want you to really be working. Then I says, Nick, I love my job, I'm not crazy. I don't plan on work until I'm 80, I said, but um, we'll see what we can do. So again, you know, it's developing those check funds, you know, so I'm thinking, okay, I want to do something for them. I can't do a lot, um, but I certainly can help save, okay, to do that. God, God willing, I'm still going to be able to help them too um, when they're in college. Um, my, his, he's got three, you know, he, he and his wife are both only children and they have three children of their own. They wanted a big family. God bless them, you know, we'll figure it out somehow. 
These are now your resources. So now I'm gonna leave you with the things that you're going to wanna look into over time, all right? We've gone over a lot. I've talked very, very fast. I really didn't give a lot of opportunity for questions, but we'll have them at the end. But these are some of the resources that you wanna consider. These are some of the better websites that have the most powerful information. This is our Connecticut stuff. Please don't overlook what Connecticut has to offer for you. Even on this Chesil loan program, you don't have to go to a school in Connecticut, all right? You, as a Connecticut resident, can utilize this if you're going out of state, all right? Out of state schools may not recommend it to you because they may not know much about it. But our Connecticut loan program is a model program for the nation, okay? A model program for the nation. So please look into that, okay? Outside scholarships. This is big. I, I can't tell you enough about, please make sure you do a search. Get started on it right now. I like to say, okay, if you're just doing scholarship searches, set up your own Gmail account and only scholarship stuff is going in there so you can focus on that, okay? Um, look for opportunities um, will be, you know, where there's less applicants. Um, start with your town, your major, ancestry, things like that. Notify the college when you win the scholarship. Um, it may reduce your award. Most colleges, it's not. Most of us are not meeting needs, so we'll be happy with most what students bring to the table. There's a few colleges that meet need 100%. That's your big Ivy Leagues and whatnot. If you're bringing them outside scholarships, they may reduce your aid on there. But that's the rarer case these days. Here's some of your potential sources right now. Don't overlook any of them. These are some of the better websites. FastWeb is my favorite. School Soup is a good one. Admissions Hook. Um, Scholarship America is another good one for around here. Tuition funding sources. And I'm sure the guidance office can maybe add to that list as well. You should never be paying for any scholarship search you do. Do not pay for them because there's just so much out there on the internet. It's so easy now to do those searches. Please do that. Um, some will require a FAFSA. And some will even offer renewals of the awards, okay, um, from year to year. So you say they offer renewals. So the scholarships you're applying for are looking for are one year. Not always. Not always. Um, a lot of them are. Some of the local ones are probably more renewable. You know, employers, communities, stuff like that are obviously renewable. Some of the outside scholarship searches could also be renewable too, but a lot of the, you know, some of the general ones are, you know, out on the website or some, you know, one time could be a couple thousand dollars and you might not receive it again. But a lot of the local ones, the more community-based, are oftentimes renewable. Net price calculator, anybody know about these? It's just a tool. If you want to kind of go out there and do some searching, um, it might be the place in which the parents do the searching if the students got like high interest and you went on that trip on that tour and you're like hey I don't think we're gonna be able to afford this one I gotta maybe we gotta maybe stay away from it this might be a place where you kind of want to play around with it if you feel that you got to go more with your head than your heart okay it's basically gonna look at this oh and I forgot to change that it should be 2017 tax returns Um, we're always concerned about loans and students if they're going into you know you know you're going into the four five six year programs um, seven year programs you want to take a look at how much do I think I want to borrow if they want to be an English major or they want to be an artist or a musician they want to do that kind of thing you you kind of want to see you know how much is it going to cost me how much do I think I'm going to earn and do some kind of calculations what's going to cost me at the end of my um, academic career before I go out into the workplace. So these are some calculators that I think are good for, for you kind of to get a sense of what you want to do. These are top things to consider. These are things that we've already talked about. Um, questions to ask. Always have these kind of like in your hip pocket when you're going on a tour, if you're talking to the college or university and you have any kind of special circumstances, get in your head the kind of things you want to ask each one of the colleges and universities um, so that you can see their reaction. Each one of them may be different. And then again, these are the final things. Um, 
The most important one is probably on here that I didn't cover. I always know that, you know, um, it's that college that's going to cost you $25,000. And you're like, oh. you know, we're giving out the one that was only going to cost us seven, and we're going to the one that's costing us $25,000. Um, remember, that 25 is just not for year one. It's for year one and probably year two plus, and year three plus plus, and year four plus plus plus. So you're already talking having to finance $100,000, and if you're not going to be able to do a good portion of it out of your income and you're going to tack on some student loans in there as well, you could be one of that 4% that's going to be hedging over into something that might be a little bit more than you can reasonably take on. And what you don't want to have happen is all of a sudden you be rejected after year two because you can't get a loan now again in year three because they're either looking at your credit or your debt to income ratio and you've got multiple kids going to college and you're having to make choices between the two. So I always say, you know, if you're thinking you're going to take on the higher cost institution up front, remember it's not just for one year, it's for four years. And how much is that going to cost you? And then maybe you have to think a little bit differently um, depending on your own special circumstances. So that's pretty much it. That's pretty much the presentation. Um, I hope you found it helpful. Um, but do we want to open it up for questions and answers, or did you want to go over anything else? Okay. Local scholarships. And if you've heard me speak before about local scholarships, you've heard me say that you know our community is one of the most charitable communities that I've worked at, and I've been at five high schools. Um, so you know that's saying something. Um, but if you look down, this is last year's scholarship list, but it's a starting point for students and parents. And where you would start is you'd look at the town that you live in and then start looking at the scholarships that are offered in that town. There's also um, an area for graduates from our region and then um, graduates um, just from in general. Um, this is a listing of local scholarships so it does not include the national level or New England level scholarships. This is more just our communities. These will be updated and we launch in uh, January 1 for the 2019 scholarship list. But this is a good place to start because most of them are uh, renewed annually, meaning that the scholarship committees have enough funds that they can offer the scholarships that they offered the year before. Many of these scholarships are renewable for four years. So if you were to receive a $1,000 scholarship, for example, for your freshman year, you could reapply and get that as a sophomore, a junior, and a senior for four years of an undergraduate degree. That's a big deal because many scholarships that we see are designed for that first year experience. So a student may get a lot of money that first year going into freshman year in scholarship, but then those scholarships are not available for second, third, or fourth year. And that's really important when students are looking at it. It's nice to get all that money that first year. We're not going to knock that either, because that then hopefully can, you can save your resources for the following years. Uh, but many of the local scholarships in um, Region 12 are renewable for four years. So I think this is a good place to start. This really should be a homework assignment um, for your kids. You know, I noticed that we have less students here tonight than we did for the college admission seminar, and that's sort of been our um, understanding when we work with students. You know, many of them are trying to navigate the application process, but when we start talking about finances, they really get overwhelmed. And I think with our life experience as adult parents, you know, we, we really can help them through that, but they need to understand their impact point on the finances, as Julie had already said. So that's one, and then um, you got a handout that's green. That one has some scholarship websites that we like. Um, Julie had them in her slideshow as well. 
um, but that would be a good place to start. Um, while, while we were sitting I, and listening to um, Julie speak, I did a quick search, and on FinAid's website, there's a nice, quick um, EFC calculator, so estimated family contribution. Um, it's sobering, um, so I, I did it while we were sitting here, and the amount of money that the federal government says that I can come up with would get me a very nice luxury vehicle. That would be four times that I would be doing that, not just the one, and I wouldn't have five or six years to pay for that luxury vehicle, that would be each year. I'd be purchasing that luxury vehicle and then off the cliff it would go because I'd need to then buy another one the second year and year three and then year four. So I think, you know, as you start looking at those numbers and then making those big decisions about how that money is going to come together, what is that going to look like? And a lot of times, as Julie already said with her formulas, we see students and parents doing a combination of student work, you know, so summer jobs, work during the school year, so student has an impact point there, some skin in the game from the students, so they're taking out some loans, and then parents are also taking out loans and parent income. So really it's, it's trying to put all those pieces together to see what it's going to look like. And at the end of the day, you know, if the EFC is, is $40,000, and that's what the government says that you should be able to write the check for, or the family is a system. Trying to figure that out and how that makes sense is really important because maybe that school doesn't make sense. You know, maybe that kind of debt doesn't make sense. All right. So those are a couple of thoughts I had. Um, take questions, Julie or myself. If we had any, I know I always come away from this night with my mind being somewhat numbed um, because it is a lot of information to take in. A few years, for a few years, we did breakout sessions afterwards on how to do the, the FAFSA, how to do the CSS profile, and really by this point in the night, most people are ready to go home. So um, we tend to try and give that information out in small bits as we go through. Joyce, a quick question. If a student wants to take off like a, um, a gap year, how does that work for financial aid? Um, the gap year is actually okay. Um, sometimes, sometimes it's actually good. The problem that I would have with that is um, you've got to make sure with your colleges and universities that you're applying to that when they come back that they'll be treated like with the financial aid of, of incoming freshmen. All right. So um, some schools actually recommend it and it depends on what they do in that gap year. If you're going to take courses somewhere, that's probably not necessarily considered a gap year, but if they wanted to do like a study abroad experience or they wanted to work for a little bit or something that's usually it. The other part of it's if it's taking coursework somewhere else they sometimes then come in as a transfer student versus a gap year so you got to be careful when you're taking that particularly if you really know the institution you want to attend um, you know after that you know so I mean you might you also have your thoughts on that? You don't. <laughs> I don't have any thoughts about gap year. Um, in terms of financial aid, I think typically that financial aid package can be deferred if the college, um, yeah, they allow if they allow that deferment. So I think that's key. I think the gap year can be nice because you can put some money away, you know, as a student. Um, it's one way to do that and maybe build some other experiences or take a couple classes that might be able to be transferred. Um, that was another thought that just uh, came up. You know, that's one way to stay within that four years as students may be looking at community college over the summer, you know, when they're home uh, working, maybe take a class to try and stay within that four years because, you know, when we start putting on another five, you know, another fifth year or sixth year, that's where the money really can add up. I mean, it's, it's tough as it is, but if you're looking down the road at five or six years for a four-year degree, that can be really expensive. I just want to draw your attention to one of the other documents that we handed out, um, the Sample University. This is one of the documents that sort of um, highlights what students get in the spring, typically, or sometimes earlier now that we have the prior prior, from the university. And this is important to look at because students often will get it in an email. You may never see it as parents, and students don't always check their email. And I, I found that with my, my older son, is that he was getting things from financial aid office that he was supposed to sign and then send back, and he didn't think it was a big deal until the tuition came, and I'm like, well, why do we owe $5,000 more? 
And I'm looking down, I call the financial aid office, and they're like, well, your son never signed the document, said he was accepting his loan. Oh, well, he needs to get his butt over there and sign the document. So that's important to stay on top of, you know, if the students are accepting those monies, that they are following through on the agreements that go along with that. Just like we know when we sign up for our car loans, we're paying those car loans, right? And we agreed to do that. Kids don't always get that idea. But on this sheet, this is typically it's a sign off yes or no. So you can see on this form, so if the student was to receive the scholarship, there's a yes, no. And we always, you know, I, I, we typically counsel students to accept that scholarship money, right? So that they do, um, you know, comes off their tuition. There's no reason not to accept the scholarship money. But they may not want to take an unsubsidized loan, right? If they have other access to income, and if we look in that bottom line, federal staff are loan, I'm, subs I'm, I'm struggling, unsubsidized, there we go, I'm out of water. Um, they may not want to take that. And so there is really an agreement factor when these award letters come, and we're happy to talk um, kids through that, you guys through that, and one of our recommendations also is to reach out to the financial aid office if you have questions about what this award letter looks like. But this is a really key factor in the process. What we saw last year is some of the schools were sending these award letters back in like an early fall, you know, because that's that was their process, and some schools st stayed with their old methodology which was the January 1 filing, so they didn't really get those award letters back until um, spring or late spring. Some kids not even until April or May, they weren't getting the award letters back. Yeah, we're not, our timetables are changing, by the way, from both colleges and universities have not changed the timetables too, too much about accepting students on the traditional timetables that you've had in the past or sending out awards. It's primarily going to be pretty aggressive we did see a mix last year with our acceptances so kids are applying early and the college was doing the financial aid package along the same time frame we're getting some of those award letters at the same time so you really knew you know accepted and how much it was going to cost and then what your your awards were so whether the merit-based scholarship or loans you know what your package looked like the other one I wanted to highlight is just our um, events you know, that we try and put on throughout the year. One of the big ones that's come on the last couple years, um, we call it Pizza, Cookies, and Cash. Um, it's a fun event. The seniors that participated in it last year, it's in March. Um, we actually dig into all the local scholarships and other scholarships that come into our office. Um, I buy pizza, somebody in the office bakes cookies and we hopefully find them cash. And so it's a nice afternoon activity. It's right after school for about an hour and a half. Um, one of the students last year said it was so much fun, they wish we would do a Sunday cash uh, day, but we didn't, we just did this one. But I really found that helps because it, it really gets kids kicked off in filling out the applications for scholarship. You know, it hopefully takes out any of the, the challenges that are in the way there. they're available from February but then I noticed on here that some of them are actually deadlines are March so yep. it is a really can they get the applications earlier than February or is that going to be a quick turnaround yeah so typically um, when we get them we our goal is to launch by the time we get back from winter break so most of them come into the office right around that time but some are not updated you know, some of the local scholarship committees have a number of people that are working to, you know, volunteer their time and put stuff together, and sometimes it's one person. Um, and so really it's when they have completed their update to their scholarship, figured out how much money they have to offer for the year, that we get it. Um, and so we house the local scholarship. Some are online, so you can find them in addition to our um, online system and paper forms, and some are just here, so they're Chapaug specific. So the first, um, the senior class future planning meeting, that we already did. So that was, well, actually the, that one we will go in um, when we meet with uh, seniors individually. So that's a future planning meeting where we do sit down. Okay. The college admission night was last week. Right. Um, we go into senior projects, it's not on the list, but starting Monday uh, we're going in. And we'll be going every two weeks where we basically break down that college admission presentation from last week 
into manageable chunks. So they're about 20 minute presentations of actionable items. So one of their first items they're gonna get is how to uh, set up their common app, how to set up their online um, applications, how to do letters of recommendation, um, and then how do they match Naviance with common apps. So it's actually a workshop model where we do that. And that's broken up every two weeks from September, October, November, December. As we get into December, it's really the financial aid piece because most kids have done the application part of it. Um, but we really try and do it as a learning model for kids so they have the expertise on how to apply. Yeah, like this, uh, an elective for them to go to, or is it a mandatory that they go to it? They don't get a choice. Oh, so we yeah, push okay. into senior okay. project, um, and they have to sit there and listen to us. Right, yeah. Um, so that's a mandatory. And, and basically, it's the college admission night broken up into manual chunks that let kids um, be able to do what they need to do to get to college. Um, and then other ones that are coming up, let's see. We got the Litchfield College Fair tomorrow night. Uh, that's a nice night. I'll be there, you know, hobnobbing, talking to people, trying to push Chapaug and all the college admission reps, um, and uh, highlighting Chapaug with the admission reps, not pushing us. And then um, the Danbury Mall is another one. And again, it's an opportunity for students to make that connection with admission reps that are going to read their applications. So after looking at the list, if a, a college is on there, want to make sure that the student is there and shaking that person's hand and giving them eye contact, um, making them know who they are. All right, that's an important night for that. Same thing with Danbury. Danbury's a bigger fair, but another opportunity, again, to make that direct contact with the missions. Because part of this game, as we talked about last week, is getting in. The other part of the game is figuring out how to pay for it. Right? It's a two-part two -part process. And we are working on, in November, it's listed as the NCAA College Athlete Night for those that are thinking about athletics. We are working right now to try and get Sam Morofsky, uh, who is a D1 signed athlete, and her parent to come in and talk. It looks like we're in process for, for getting that, um, hopefully soon. So that should be a good night. So, brief. Other questions? Yep. Um, assistance for military families. If you're um, expected to receive assistance from the federal government for ready for college for your children, um, do colleges also give you additional um, military assistance as well, or is that deemed you already received it and you have no? No, um, that's, that's a good question. Um, the whole new VA, Chapter 33, you have to go and get evaluated based on what you qualify for through the Veterans Affairs and see what you qualify for. And that there's a whole list of institutions that help support, um, you know, Yellow Ribbon, you know, Chapter 33 and all of those um, new veterans benefits, Go Army, all of those different areas. Um, so it's, we actually match them you know, and it depends on, everybody's different depending on how much they're going to get, the, you know, the um, period of time in which they get it, and how many months they get it. Um, and then institutions will try to counsel you to how you can spread that out and make it work in your whole four-year experience. But yes, there's a number of institutions that are signed up with the Yellow Ribbon, and usually on the website with the VA, and if you qualify for it, they'll give you the information of who's who contributes in addition to the veteran's benefits. What about, like, we're involved with the DEA program, the Dependence Educational Assistance Program. Oh, the Dependence, yeah, I mean. So, I mean, we already know what our awards are going to be. Right. So does that factor into the calculator for the college? For the co college will take that into consideration because depending on where you're going to get and how much you're going to get, um, you're not going to get over awarded either, but they'll want to, if you're going to, say for example, like at our institution, when somebody comes to us with that amount of benefit and you know how you're going to get it throughout the four years, we may have to say, you know what, you're, you're supposed to get this scholarship from us, but we really want to get you this other money because it's going to come at, at different pieces, you know, and we might say to you, okay, let's defer the scholarship that we're going to give you to a later time. So we'll use what you're eligible for through your DE, it's the DED, the D Dependence Assistance Program through the Veterans Benefits, right, for the dependent students. So you'll get pieces of that, and then at some point it might run out. And well, you're only allowed so many months. So much, well, you're allowed a certain amount every year. Yeah. So you're guaranteed that amount every year. Yeah, so, yeah. 
well some people are, don't always get the four years always you know not everybody's in the same well, the unique. groups yeah it's unique it's unique to the person and the eligibility so I mean I, I would always bring you got to bring it forward because you're gonna have to apply for it and the money's gonna actually come through the the institutions now as opposed to the past unless they have extra housing money and stuff like that that they might give but for the defendants everything's pretty much coming through the colleges so they'll help you plan for that but they certainly can give you something in addition to that and if you have any other special questions you should always reach out to the VA and then have them give you a list of the institutions who really do a good job of that So I was just saying to Mrs. Steinis that I think we probably could talk about this for another hour, but we've already talked it for almost two hours. So I think we killed it tonight. Um, big round of applause for Julie. Really coming her expertise. Thank you all for coming tonight, and uh, hopefully this was helpful. Have a have a great night.